Uh, I have to apologize, Professor Haichova, for not being here because she's participating in another online event just now. So sorry for this. Uh, today, uh, we have a guest from Masaryk University in Brno. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome here uh, Martin Angel. However, uh, before giving the floor to the speaker, I'm happy that uh, Radek Shimik kindly agreed to say a few introductory words about Martin and his work. So first Radek and then Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Magda, and also thanks uh, for uh, <clears throat> uh, making this possible for Martin to speak in this venue, because I was looking for some venue in Prague for Martin to speak at where he could uh, maybe um, get interesting feedback, and this was uh, a good option. So a few words about Martin. Martin Vongiel studied in Krakow and Katowice, where he was uh, still back then interested in phonology. But after coming to Brno in 2009, he discovered his love for formal semantics and uh, worked under the guidance of Moimir Dochekal. Martin uh, has been very productive and managed to publish more than 10 papers before his PhD, which is uh, remarkable for a theoretical linguist. Uh, Martin's primary research interest is the semantics of numerals and quantification, and more recently he has started exploring its interfaces to morphosyntax and to cognition. For his dissertation entitled Subatomic Quantification, Martin received the prestigious Beth Dissertation Prize awarded by the Association for Logic, Language and Information. His dissertation is currently under consideration for publication at the open access publisher Language Science Press. So um, Martin, the word is yours now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Radek and, and Magda, for a very nice introduction. Um, so I will first... Um, I'm very happy to be here, first of all. Yes, and, and, and it's a great honor. So what I will do is I will... Uh, oh, uh, the... Uh, so I will send you the... Uh, the link to the slides if you're interested in downloading the presentation so that should be easy if something doesn't work i can i i can do it sorry martin i i, I no 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 haven't That's... done it so okay. far so I, I i i'm doing it right now no, so it's... you can find a link to martin uh slides okay so i will sorry. just no that's fine i will just so can you see the slides just like can you right okay so yes it's fine uh, so I'm so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, various cognitive and linguistic uh, perspectives on counting, and in doing so I will introduce some material that um, that is part of my um, of my thesis, but there will be also new material and and a, and a general overview. So we will look at counting of holes in general, but I will also um, say something about uh, count partitives and, and, and counting parts of entities and how natural language uh, seems to encode those, um, those operations. So, uh -huh, wait a second, why not? Right, okay. So before we begin, um, so we, what we should do is to distinguish three different senses in which uh, um, a word such as counting is, is, is used. And those senses are related, but at the same time, it's, they're different. So, so it's, it's, it's very important to keep that in mind. So, so counting is, uh, is a common um, procedure that we all know from our everyday um, uh, life experience, something we do on a regular basis. I will look at both uh, cognitive aspects of, of, of that procedure and also various ways in, in which th this procedure is, um, uh, is reflected in, in grammar and, and in the computation, computational mechanism um, of semantics. So the first, the first aspect or the first sense of counting is something we, what we use in, uh, in a count list when we re recite a sequence of symbols as in 1a, something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The sequence gives us a relative ordering, which is very crucial uh, for counting, but it's, it doesn't, doesn't 
do much else. So this is the, the first aspect of, of counting. So it's like a count list. There is another use uh, which I will refer to as an arithmetical uh, sense of counting, which is basically a um, way in which we um, uh, oper operate on abstract uh, number concepts. So in language, uh, we could say something like 1b, 3 times 2 equals 6. In, and here, uh, the number words seem to refer to some abstract, um, abstract number uh, concepts rather than anything else. And finally, the third uh, flavor of counting is uh, is uh, is basically quantification in which the number word gives us uh, provides a hint or gives us a cardinality of a, of a set as in one C three cats when we have a plurality of objects. Okay, so just to keep in, that in mind, those are three different things. Okay, there it, there are good reasons to believe that those things are related to each other and that they have something in common. Probably some common core, but those are three different ways. So, so that we're all on, on the on the on the same page. Okay. So, so the plan for today is that I will look at cognitive perspectives, then I will talk about linguistic perspectives, and then I will sketch a proposal um, uh, which will consist of two parts. The first part will be I will informally introduce what um, uh, a general uh, counting. Uh, mechanism I propose uh, that uh, I believe there are good reasons to believe that applies in natural language and then I will show how this could be captured and um, in and implemented formally in a framework I work in. I know that most of the people here probably don't work in a framework I do so but I but I hope this will be you know at least the intuitive part will uh, the informal part will give you a good a good idea of what the formula is is, uh, is able to do and then of course we can discuss it if 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 if, if you wish okay so let's start with uh, with cognition uh, so it is very well known in the cognitive literature that um, what we call quantification is uh, basically uh, stems from two different distinct cognitive systems uh, not only in uh, in So the first system is uh, typically referred to as OTS, object tracking system. So if you look at figure one, uh, you have a, you, you 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 can see a mamadak with three ducklings. Okay, so in the in this case, the mamadak uh, can quantify over uh, over uh, her ducklings uh, based on 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 a procedure that distinguish. Uh, distinguish each of the of the ducklings. The second cognitive system is typically called uh, the ANS, uh, the approximate number system. And in this case, there is no object tracking, but rather an instant, um, an immediate uh, recognition of a total um, of a total quantity. So that would be um, represented in the figure two, when you have a mama duck with uh, uh, with much more ducklings. And in this case, the mama duck, um, say the movement of each of her ducklings, but rather just uh, uh, approximate the number, okay? So the object tracking system is a mental ability uh, in humans and in non-human uh, animals to immediately enumerate small sets. So, so the way it happens, is that you track uh, you track uh, objects and there is no counting understood uh, as some kind of operation based on individuation that you individuate objects and you put them in a one to one correspondence with numbers. Uh, in humans, this manifests in infants. Okay, uh, and if you if you want to test that uh, how how it works, so look at Figure three, and if you are to say without counting how many marks uh, there are, uh, you cannot do that. Okay, so in humans you can do it uh, up to four uh, elements, in some other animals uh, only up to three, uh, but in humans up to four. Uh, However, if you do a, a trick everyone uh, knows, if you divide it, the, the big set into smaller subsets, uh, to, now you can immediately tell, tell that there are eight marks. Okay, so this is because in figure three, you're unable uh, to 
track each of the uh, of the objects. Okay, so so in humans, this is possible uh, up to four objects to to use the object tracking system to um, to count. Okay, so the second uh, the second system is the approximate number system. And in this case, you, uh, what we're dealing with is a kind of estimation of the magnitude of a, of a plurality of objects. So again, so, so in this case, there's no individuation involved. Uh, there's no reliance on symbolic representation. So you don't even do a one-to-one -one correspondence with, with symbols. Rather, you just, just, you just approximate. And, um, and again, in humans, it manifests in infants and develops uh, with age. Um, adults can, um, uh, can, can do that with the 15% uh, accuracy, okay? So if you have two sets in, in figure five and, and you are asked to tell which set has more uh, office clips, uh, even without counting, you can say that you should be possible to say if you're an, uh, uh, you know, a healthy adu adult um, human being that the, uh, the set on the right has more, uh, has more clips. Uh, I think it's nine and 10 or, or 10 and or 11, whatever. Uh, when the difference up to 15%, you're most probably will be successful in telling uh, which set has more. Again, without tracking, tracking objects or, or, or any kind of individuation, right? So, uh, mm, so if we go back to our DAX, okay, so uh, in figure one, if our uh, mama duck will lose one of her ducklings, she will immediately recognize that one is missing because uh, she lost track of one of those. But in figure two, if there's, uh, there, are, there are a lot of ducklings, the mama duck might not, uh, uh, might not realize that she has lost a duckling unless uh, the uh, she lost uh, uh, unless that duckling the number of ducklings she lost uh, constitutes a big proportion of the um, of her entire family. Okay. Right. So so number as 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 at this point should be clear that number sense is not something that is uh, human specific. This is something that is widely attested in non-human animals. So there are a lot of experiments on primates uh, and primates. Something has kicked me out, but uh, uh, let's hope it won't happen again. All right. Yeah, sorry for that. Okay, so so uh, it is very well known that primates are very good in uh, various in, in performing various operations on quantities. So can do so they can do apprehension, then they can compare um, two sets uh, and telling which one is bigger, and they can even do uh, approximate uh, addition. Uh, this is also true uh, of other mammals. So. Uh, Dolphins, cats, and rats has been have been shown to to have similar properties. Uh, also in non-mammals, so birds and fish. And there are, are two papers that argue I, I was able to find the, 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 uh, that argue that um, there is something called uh, plant arithmetic. So 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 also in carnivorous plants. So uh, how, how they're called in English, Drosera or whatever. So so those carnivorous plants that eat. Uh, flies, right? So they can uh, count up to three or four um, uh, in a way that when a fly uh, touches them and they need to realize that there is a, a repeated movement uh, so that they close their, um, the trap. 
so there's uh, so this is something that is widespread. Okay, so number sense is widespread in the domain of creatures of the world. However, there is no so far there is no evidence for symbolic addition. Uh, except uh, for chimpanzees and only after long training and uh, often there are multiple errors and so on. So approximate addition is something you find in primates, but if you want to learn to teach them um, uh, symbolic addition, uh, this, this has been done only in the case of the chimpanzee and, and still it required a long, long training. So with this respect, it seems there is something that seems to be um, specific, um, human specific, a uh, human specific skill. Uh, so how does it? So how does it happen? What do we know from the cognitive psychology? So what happens when we count? So, so it turns out there's a lot of implicit knowledge uh, in children when it, when it comes to counting, and children are never uh, taught that knowledge so there's there's no there's no explicit formulation uh, uh, of this kind of knowledge it seems that it is either innate or it develops very at, the, at a very early stage of of, um, um, of our development and 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 what, what children do is that they intuitively understand uh, that there is such a thing as the cardinality of a set and that it is conserved it doesn't change uh, when you introduce modifications that do not uh, affect quantity so you could for example so you could change the order of objects in figure six uh, and and children intuitively understand that this is a kind of modification that does not affect the cardinality of of, of the entire set what children also uh, understand intuitively and no one teaches them is that each entity must be counted uh, once and once only. Okay, so no one explicitly tells them so well you cannot count uh, the apple in the set twice. Okay, so when you when you put that in uh, correspondence with numbers, you need to have a one to one correspondence. Uh, so this is this is sort of surprising. Uh, because this suggests that there's much more knowledge uh, of counting uh, than uh, than initially uh, suspected, and and this knowledge seems to be governed uh, by something that is uh, often refers to as the inner pr principles of counting. Uh, so first of all, um, you need an ordered list of symbols. And, and that list of symbols, you need a stable order there, okay? So in figure seven, uh, this is represented by the number line. So you have one, two, three. So you have symbols that are ordered along the, um, in, uh, in a particular relative ordering. So it makes a lot of difference if you say one, two, three, or uh, two, three, one, say, okay? So this is, this, so the, the relative ordering is crucial. The second thing that governs uh, counting and, and, and children seem, to, seem to, to understand it intuitively is the one-to-one -one correspondence. So that when you count, uh, you, um, uh, uh, you, uh, you relate uh, symbols uh, to objects. And in that process, uh, the last symbol you use corresponds to the cardinality of the entire set. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is the the uh, the basic layer of the psychology of counting. Uh, so what happens uh, it, when a child develops is that the, the different um, those different principles appear at different uh, stages. Okay, so uh, in children that are six to eighteen months uh, old. Uh, what you have is that the two first uh, principles are there, okay? So stable order and one-to-one -one correspondence um, uh, is there. But the third principle stating that the last uh, symbol employed tells you something about the cardinality of the entire set is not, it's not manifested yet, okay? So, so, my, so my daughter is at this stage right now. So, so, so uh, children, when asked to count things, they could say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, say, okay? And, and they make no mistakes. And then you ask them to give you two or three objects and they will give you a random number of objects, okay? So there's no understanding either uh, the procedure of, of, uh, of relating numbers to, um, 
to entities is there, but there's no understanding that um, uh, at the end, the last symbol tells you something about the cardinality. But that, at, at, at around the age of two years, that, that's in place and they, they can do that. At uh, the age of two and a half years, they understand that counting is an abstract procedure, okay, and that you can uh, apply it to different kinds of objects. So, so, so you you can that this is something um, something um, underlying and something more uh, abstract than just uh, uh, pointing to I don't know, this is like uh, um, teddy bears or whatever. Okay, uh, around one year later. Uh, children have a very good understanding uh, of that the order of recitation is crucial and the order of pointing at objects is irrelevant. Okay, so if you go back here, so it doesn't matter if I start from the apple and I say apple one, banana two, and the cherry three, or whether I start from, start from the cherry and go the opposite direction, and I point at the random direction, okay, it doesn't matter as long as um, as long as the order of number of, of symbols is uh, is preserved okay and children can indicate and correct supple errors so if you if you try to you know if you play with them and you and you and you say start uh, uh, from the cherry and you say cherry one banana two apple three cherry uh, four they say no 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 you've counted uh, the cherry twice so this is this is this is this is wrong okay and at the age of four years, it's like uh, children are are fluent in counting, and they know that it can be generalized to novel situations. So, so they 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 become uh, they, they become um, advanced in this in this um, skill. Okay. So, how does it happen? So, what's the theory behind this? So, so the most um, so let's call it a cognitive dogma so this is like the most widespread most widely accepted uh, theory of how this happens is the so-called Quinean bootstrapping and in this uh, in this theory you will see that there is a crucial linguistic component okay and the idea is that uh, uh, the child first learns um, uh, learns numerals uh, number words as uh, and and that she learns uh, uh, the ordered list, the, the relative order is uh, similar. And at this stage, uh, it's nothing more than um, learning things like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Okay, children love those kind of things. And what's important here is like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's like it means nothing. What's important is that uh, the symbols come uh, in this particular order. So similarly, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six would be would be something something like that. And that's that's it. That's the first stage, according to the to the theory. At the second stage, there is um, uh, uh, so children start to understand that actually this string of symbols um, is consists of uh, of discrete elements. So things like one, two, three, and so on, and that those elements have meanings, right? So say three uh, means. Uh, say the number three. This is not very obvious whether it is like that, but let's let's say it's just three refers to the number three. And at the third stage, uh, they uh, uh, what what develops is th that they uh, they know how the list represents uh, uh, numbers. So they know that the meaning of the number one word three um, represents the cardinality of the set. Um, um, uh, in figure eight, say. Okay, so this is the this is the the, the general. So this is the most widely accepted um, theory of of of, uh, of how uh, children acquire counting. But there are also a couple of um, footnotes that should be added. So first of all, not everything can be counted, right? Um, so so it seems that um, there is good evidence to believe that. Uh, there's something called the object substance distinction uh, in humans, something that is either again, either innate or develops at a very, very early stage of development. And this is uh, something that goes against a famous claim by Quine uh, that would say that the, uh, 
basic mass count distinction is something that is provided by grammar. So, so the fact that mud is uh, uh, is mass is a mass word, uncountable word, and say what apple an apple is a countable um, world is just just the matter of grammar the, the way it is it is done in natural language. So there are there are a number of experiments that suggest that actually uh, there are certain ontological commitments that again are either innate or or or, or start at a very early uh, phase and uh, anyway this is like they manifest in infants and and those commitments are certain assumptions with respect to the nature of objects so it seems that we're designed in such a way that we distinguish objects that are bounded uh, uh, entities that have natural boundaries that are cohesive um, so parts of those uh, uh, things uh, stick together they come in one piece and those entities move across space along continuous paths and this is something else uh, and we treat those things as something else than, than than substances which lack those properties okay uh, this is something that has been also shown in non-human animals and and counting would only apply to those uh, those things that we conceptualized as objects and not as substances okay. um, one very crucial um, uh, and interesting uh, aspect of, of this distinction is um, is uh, the role of spatial uh, integrity uh, there is a series of experiments uh, relating uh, to broken objects. Uh, so if I ask you, uh, if you to, count, to tell me how many uh, forks there are in figure nine, uh, most of you would probably say just five. Some of you might wonder whether the broken fork counts as a fork or not. So maybe say, okay, well, four. Uh, but none of you would, uh, I, I assume if you're an, a, a healthy adult person, no, no, none of you would say something that children uh, insist on at the age between three and four years. Uh, they would say that there are uh, six forks in, uh, in this picture. Okay, so, so at this age, uh, children cannot help themselves, so, so they cannot stop counting things that come in one piece as, as one object. So when asked to count forks, they would see one, then the second fork is split into two parts, so they would see two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so, uh, so at this age, uh, children simply count discrete objects and, and that's it. And it also spreads to other domains, so and other forms of linguistic quantification. Uh, so for example, in comparative constructions, children would say that uh, there are more forks on the left than there are on the right, uh, because there are two uh, spatially distinct integrated objects, although it's just a broken fork. And they would also say that there are some forks on the left uh, and not there, on the right. So they would plural use the use the plural to refer to broken things. Okay. So this this suggests at some, at later age they 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 realize that um, uh, what's meant in this experiment is probably counting things that uh, belong to a or represent uh, or instantiate a particular kind of thing and and doesn't matter whether it's broken or not we can somehow retrieve the its internal part with structure uh, or whatnot uh, but but at this age at the early age they just they just count things that come in one piece and that's it and it suggests that whatever uh, whatever happens later is based on this very uh, very early mechanism that you simply um, simply uh, relate numbers uh, to uh, objects that are sp spatially integrated holes. Okay, um, so this takes us to the to the last part of 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 of, of the first part of of this talk, um, namely um, to uh, particle structures and what particle structures are. So there is a very old uh, in philosophy. There is a very old uh, ontological intuition uh, dating at, at least to pre-Socratics and something that. Um, no, it, it needed a couple of thousand of years but to develop into, into muriology. But the intuition is basically this, that entities are often made up of smaller entities, of parts. And what's 
interesting is in the two dialogues of Plato in Parmenides and the uh, I never know how to pronounce the um, the uh, there's this problem how to distinguish between unity something that is an object and uh, simply an arbitrary sum of parts and Plato's um, argument is uh, what distinguishes the the two concepts or the two types of entities is structure so uh, object um, are specific uh, configuration of parts. Okay, so so the, the, there are configurations of parts that are structured, unlike arbitrary sums. And at this point, it should also dis distinguish between two senses of parthood. So in Figure 11, we have something that in semantics is often called material parthood. In this case, we have one entity, and we have part of that entity. So in this terms, we quantify. In this case, we quantify in terms of volume. And in figure 12, we have something that is called individual parthood. So, uh, so we have a collection of apples, some arbitrary sum of apples, and, uh, and part of that set would be just a subset of, 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 of that set. So simply another, another arbitrary sum. So those are, again, things that are, seem to be related. And I think there's, there, there's good reason to believe that they are related, but these are two different things, right? And this intuition is uh, corroborated from what we know, again, from the cognitive literature, uh, something that is a series of experiments on part whole uh, perception. Mm, so it has been found that um, uh, in, in young children, even young children can simultaneously perceive um, entities as holes and as collection of parts. So if you look at 13, you can basically simultaneously switch whether you see a collection of fruit or a fruitman uh, and, and a whole that emerges uh, and is something more than just uh, than just um, the, just uh, just just the sum of um, uh, of parts okay so how does so we've so we've talked a little bit about um, about uh, cognitive aspects. So how does it, how does it manifest in, in language? So is there any interesting linguistic uh, evidence that would tell us that uh, those findings are somehow related to how grammar or uh, semantics uh, work? And it turns out that in some cases, yes. And in some cases, we're not so sure. So there is this, uh, known fact about numeral phrases, uh, about the grammar, the syntax of numeral phrases, that seems to, uh, seems to suggest that, that natural language reflects the distinction between the two cognitive uh, systems, the OTS and the ANS system. So there is, uh, in, one can find languages and Slavic languages are, um, are one, um, group of such languages in, in which low and high numerals um, behave differently in, uh, with respect to their syntax. So, so in Slavic, high numerals pattern with, with many. And, and you have, you find different case marking and agreement patterns. So, so in Czech, we have dvě, tři, čtyři kočky. So in this case, we have the numeral agrees in a um, in number and in gender uh, with the noun. But with higher numerals, with with pied five or, or many, uh, the, the the noun phrase is um, is in the genitive case. So so we have a different a different construction. Um, this is this is this, the same in uh, in Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian. Uh, uh, so we have dva, tri, četiri psa with, with the genitive singular. Uh, but we have uh, pet pasa, where we have the genitive uh, plural. Okay, so so different. So so one could say, well, this is a you know a, some kind of funny Slavic idiosyncrasy. Well, this is like we shouldn't pay too much attention to that. But it turns out that uh, it's not only it's not only found in Slavic. So you also find it in Finno Greek. So we you find it in one uh, Sami language, the Inari Sami language. Uh, so here, what we see is that uh, low numerals, so two, three, um, combine with noun NPs in the accusative, but um, higher numerals um, are compatible or trigger uh, the partitive case, uh, the partitive case uh, assignment. 
and this is also the case in standard Arabic so low numerals uh, uh, with low low numerals we have uh, the genitive case and with high numerals we have the accusative case okay so this is this is something that 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 is sort of uh, interesting and and one way of trying to think about it is that it reflects the grammar seems to reflect the cognitive distinction however what is important is that so far no one has uh, shown that there is any different in semantics whatsoever okay so uh, despite different grammar uh, it is not the case that two reindeer that you could come up with a linguistic test to say that two reindeer uh, in Inari Samu is something uh, has some kind of semantic effect that is different from say uh, seven reindeers okay so this is uh, so different grammar yes but no 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 different uh, different semantics uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about this. So, so another, another, another group of languages when you find something like that are classifier languages, or so-called party classifier languages. So, classifiers are um, lexical items that you uh, typically use to combine a numeral with the NP or a demonstrative. So, in in, the, in Mandarin Chinese, in eight A, so you have san, pen, shu, uh, where pen is the classifier uh, for um, volumes of books or things like that. And, you, and it is obligatory. So this so book, uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot omit it. You cannot say something like free book in, in Mandarin Chinese. So interestingly, uh, there are many languages that, that behave like that. But interesting, there are languages that, uh, and one of such languages is Mi'kmaq, an Algonquian language speak, spoken in, um, in in Eastern Canada and, and in Eastern uh, US. Plurals up to five, uh, you cannot use classifiers. So this is in 9a. So we have five, some agreement marker. You have man and the plural morpheme. And you cannot use the classifier here. But if you have higher numerals, so starting from six, as in 9b, asugum is six. And in this case, you have to use the classifier. The interface would be ungrammatical. OK, so again, there seems to be some kind of grammatical distinction. But again, no. There's no uh, evidence for a semantic distinction. Okay, so the so the second aspect um, uh, that is sort of interesting, and in this case it will be uh, more surprising, is that we've talked about the um, Quinean bootstrapping theory uh, that tells us that uh, the acquisition of of counting uh, has this very crucial linguistic component, and it's based on how the um, count list in the language looks like. And if you uh, so the theory works neatly when you look at languages such as English, but if you if you go into the rich world of languages, it turns out that uh, actually there is a very startling uh, phenomenon that is some, somewhat hard to explain on the basis of this theory. So it turns out that in many languages, we have two sets of numerals, and this is unexpected. So in English, in 10a and b, uh, there's no distinction when you uh, have a count list, so one, two, three. And when you use it to quantify over, uh, over end, it is one cat, two cats, three cats. But say in Russian, uh, the count list is different than the quantificational use. So uh, usually it's only one numeral. In some languages, there are more than one numerals. But uh, but let's let's look at the Russian and Maltese case. In Russian, you would say raz dva tri. So you have you would use the form raz raz for um, uh, for recitation. Uh, but you cannot. Uh, but in quantification, you would say adzin. Uh, uh, a very morphologically different uh, case. This is also, say, in Maltese, in Semitic, you find um, so there are two uh, there are two twos. Uh, so tnein is the form for two when you uh, perform uh, this kind of recitation or when you um, or when you perform arithmetic operations. But zeuch is a form when you use in numeral phrases. Um, and you find more, uh, and you find more of that. Okay, so 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 you find those. In, you also find something in German, German, Basque, and so on. 
So this is something, this is a widespread, widespread phenomenon, relatively widespread phenomenon. So now, uh, the bootstrapping theory would predict that um, in a language that has two, two count lists, there should be a phase uh, when children use only counting numerals. So, only, uh, so there should be a phase uh, in which children should say, Russian children, Russian speaking children should say something like razdom, uh, meaning one house. Or there should be a phase uh, in the development of multi-speaking children that they should say uh, tnein kodba, so it's like two decounting numeral uh, books. Uh, but it uh, is surprising that so far no one has tested it. I've been I'm involved in a project that is, you know, it's like we want to test that, but the you no, know, just like the Corona crisis has. Uh, stopped everything and, 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 and we have no results basically. Uh, but this is, this is sort of surprising. If the, uh, if the bootstrapping theory I'm sorry, once again, my connection is fine, but I, I don't know what happened. Yeah, sorry. Right. Um, okay, um, uh, but the- Three um, Martin, uh, just a suggestion, uh, if you stop, um, your video it might help to uh-huh okay yeah just yeah, yeah. for now and then then we switch to right you in the discussion just we will yeah. see if it helps yeah yeah yes i will thanks yeah, thanks for that wow stop mm. oh something yeah That's... Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, let's try. It. Okay. Um, okay, your slides are perfect. So. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so. Um, so the anecdotal evidence is that it never happens, okay? But we don't know for sure. And even if we, if if it's not recorded, that children with two sets of numerals should should be slower in acquisition. But as as I said, uh, we don't have any results. But that's sort of interesting, and there are clear uh, uh, predictions from this ecological theory. Okay. So I'll we'll briefly talk about the mass count distinction. This is something that is, I guess, very well known that there are two classes of nouns, countable and uncountable nouns. And this is a grammatical category, but it seems that intuitively it relates to the object substance distinction. So we have uh, numerals, uh, so we have nouns such as cat on one hand and, and, numeral, and nouns such as mud on the other. Uh, however, there is a, there is a there's a, a twist in this uh, in this story that would mean there's a neat correspondence between cognition and and, and that part of mind that uh, is um, uh, that is important for language uh, but there is a class of object mass nouns so uh, grammatically they're mass but they denote discrete objects so things like furniture silver or footwear those uh, those those words refer to to objects so there's a clash between grammar and perception and there's um, and there's uh, and this has not been reconciliated uh, by far um, so one way we know that uh, those guys are sort of fun is that is is the so-called quantity comparison task so when we look at 
um, at uh, prototypical count nouns like say, like shoes uh, in figure 14. So who has more shoes, you would say the person on the right because you have three objects. And But if we ask who has more toothpaste, you would not say the person on the right because in this case, you compare in terms of volume and uh, the number of, uh, of, uh, of portions of toothpaste are irrelevant. And object mass nouns, so things like silverware, although they're grammatically uh, uncountable, they pattern with, uh, with prototypical count nouns. So, so who has more silverware, you would say the person on the right, uh, although the volume of silver is, uh, is smaller than in the big uh, fork on the right. Okay, and, the, um, and then there's... Uh, and then there's the question of uh, proportional quantifiers, um, uh, which has to do with how we individuate particle structures and parts. Uh, so, so there seems to be a ling linguistically rele relevant distinction between arbitrary portions of, of, uh, of reference and uh, things that are uh, conceptualized as structure parts. Um, so in English, this is, uh, if we have a proportional quantifier such as part, uh, this is uh, reflected in the, in the fact that if you say something like 18a, a splinter is part of the table, you use uh, an uncountable version of part, you don't use the um, article. But if you talk about some uh, something that is structured that is not just an arbitrary portion of that of, of wood, but has probably some function, is cognitive salient, and so and whatnot, you would use a leg, uh, a version with the with with an article. So a leg is a part of the table, and and in some languages you have maybe different lexical items. So so in Czech you would have the difference between chast and gil or, or or whatnot, and there are I will. As I will show you, there are also other ways how to encode this, this distinction. Okay, I will skip this. So, so one way to identify different um, uh, natural language expressions that either refer to those contiguous or parts or not necessar necessarily refer to those contiguous parts or not necessarily is um, is a diagnostic that I call the flag test. Uh, so so you have uh, two two flags. So so in figure fifteen you have a, a Maltese like flag, and in which you have two portions of uh, of that flag that are contiguous, come in one piece or integrated. And in sixteen you have a Canadian like flag, in which case uh, the red part is divided into two strips. Uh, so they constitute approximately the 50% of the entire flag, but they're uh, but they're discont uh, discontinuous. Okay, and it turns out that uh, the languages have different ways to refer to those uh, situations. That would be true in those situations. So in English, you have a dedicated syntactic construction. So in 20a, have if you if you use the syntax 20a, have the flag is red. This is just true in both situations. However, if you use the construction 20b, a half of the flag is red. This can be true only of the uh, ab flag, of the Maltese-like flag. So it is not just true in figure 16. Uh, so a, typologically a very different language, Mandarin, but also has a different syntactic construction uh, that is dedicated to, to this spatial integrity reading. Uh, so in 21A and 21B, uh, so, so uh, uh, ban, uh, pan is, uh, um, is proportional quantifier half. And if it behaves as a, as a sort of classifier in 21A, so it attaches to the numeral, then you have both readings available. But if it behaves as a quantifier and takes a classifier on its own, then again, the only reading possible is the, uh, is the spatial integrity reading. Um, you can do a similar thing with morphological marking. So, so in Polish, you have the suffix ka that can attach to a proportional quantifier. And if you do that, as in 22b, uh, again, the only reading you get is the spatial integrity reading. So you cannot, uh, you cannot mean the um, uh, uh, flag ABA um, 
um, by, uh, by saying 22b. Uh, so you can have uh, a, a different kind of marker. So in German, you would use an additional INES in 23b. So the INES hefte the fun is hot. Again, that would kick out the interpretations in which uh, the part you're talking about is discontiguous. And, and you can have different lexical items in the language. So, so in Portuguese, you would have two half words. One is more nominal. The second one is more, um, more adjectival. And the second one, again, uh, forces you to interpret the part uh, as, as coming in one piece. And the same case, and that's the same in, in say, Dutch. OK, uh, so I think. I think uh, in the interest of time, I will skip the, the two slides and, I'm, uh, and, and I will talk a little bit about the proposal. Okay, so just to summarize, so we've seen that from the cognitive perspective, there are two different cognitive systems uh, corresponding to number sense. Uh, that acquisition of counting uh, has an important or is claimed to have an important linguistic component and the object substance distinction seems to be relevant and as we have seen, the role of spatial integrity in counting is, uh, uh, is, is crucial for children and arguably is the basis of the entire uh, procedure. Uh, so looking at language, uh, a natural language and trying to figure out what of those uh, aspects are, are relevant, it turns out that uh, there seems to be a distinction in grammar between low and high numerals, but not in, not in meaning. Uh, it seems, it is an, an unexpected surprising fact that in many languages you have two sets of numerals uh, used for different things. Um, the mass count distinction seems to relate to the object substance uh, distinction, but there is a twist. There's a class of object mass nouns that do not fit neatly into that. And, and we have seen that in uh, countative expressions, in, in, in there is a wide cross-linguistic uh, evidence that they are, there are constructions that are sensitive to whether a part of an object uh, designated by the, by the entire construction is integrated or not. So what do we do with that? Okay. So what I will propose has two parts. So first the informal part. So, so, so I propose uh, something that I refer to as general counting principles. And I take counting, uh, something that is the basic of what we find in natural language, okay? Uh, but is informed for what we know about cognition. So, so I take counting to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with numbers. This is nothing, I mean, nothing controversial here, uh, but, but for, for, this, for this to be um, successful, there need to be three, there, um, there are three um, restrictions or requirements that need to be met. So for, the first one is the non-overlap. Um, requirements. So you can do that. You can put an entity into a one-to-one -one correspondence with a number if the set consists of disjoint entities. So objects that are that, are, that do not overlap. Second, secondly, uh, what you count needs to be maximal. So you need, you need to be neurologically exhaustive. So, so you cannot leave a part of an entity for later. You take it as, a, as an entire thing. And the third part is the in integrity restriction. So you, only can, you can only count individuated and integrated holes. So if you have those uh, counting principles, so what you do is in figure 18, uh, you count apples uh, as one, two, three. This is hardly surprising. We never think uh, about it as anything you know, we should uh, uh, pay too much attention to it, but it's interesting what happens if you don't have those uh, principles and what goes wrong. So in 19, you have something I refer to as illegal counting. So a very similar operation, uh, but uh, without the uh, general counting principles. So in this case, you would uh, uh, violate uh, the non-overlap uh, condition or uh, the maximality condition or the integrity condition and you count like this, okay? One. And this is sort of funny. I, I mean, we can easily imagine such an operation, but this is not what we as humans do when we count. And it 
it becomes even clearer when we go to what I call subatomic quantification. So when we count not holes, but parts of entities. So in this case, we have a teddy bear and for whatever reason, we want to count its, uh, its parts. And if we do that, uh, we uh, simply decide what uh, comes, what counts as, uh, as a salient part and say, decide it's an ear, uh, a paw and a leg and count it one, two, three. But without the uh, general counting principles, we could end up in a situation as in figure 21, uh, which is again, an instance of illegal counting. And, uh, and this is weird, right? So we could count his ear and his leg as one, uh, but that's not a normal thing to do. And why there is, I mean, there is a sense in which it is part of the teddy bear, but it's definitely not a part of, of, of the teddy bear. So in this guy, the case, the, 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 the principle of integrity is violated. Or we could count uh, two and three, um, the half of the teddy bear and its paw, paw like this. And again, it's sort of strange because in this case, the uh, principle of non-overlap is violated. Okay? So those, those counting principles are certain, are a set of constraints on how we decide uh, what can be, um, uh, what can be uh, assigned a number in a counting procedure. So how do we, uh, so how do we, uh, how do we uh, capture it formally? Okay, so, uh, so a way we can do it is, is basically by starting with something, with uh, muriology, something very well known, in formal ontology. Um, so, so we have basically um, uh, the parthood, um, the parthood relation, and this is typically uh, um, supplemented by unrestricted sum formation. And we have, and we have, and we, if we have a set of atomic entities, so, so ABC, we can form uh, pluralities of those entities. So any, so, so a, any possible sum we can form. But the problem with mirrorology is that if you have only this in your in your model, then uh, the whole, so the A and B and C uh, at the very top, is basically equivalent to the sum of its parts. Okay, so there's nothing else that makes it at whole. And this is sort of problematic because we have already seen that what we want is actually something more, something stronger, something that would tell us, well, there is the way, so, so going back to, the, to Plato's in, in, in intuition, we want some, also some kind of structure, some kind of arrangement of parts to be encoded in, uh, in our semantic model. And this can be done by uh, um, by augmenting muriology with topology and and the theory of holes called muriotopology. When you have a muriological component, and you add some uh, topological relations holding between parts, so that you can model various spatial configurations in which parts are with respect to each other. And this is not something I I mean I'm one of the one of a few researchers that, that that does it this way, but it was it's not me who has introduced it. This is this date backs to to Grimm's uh, dissertation a couple of years ago, uh, and it has been successfully used to, for example, to model the con collective singulative number distinction in languages, or also in in to to um, to to have some interesting uh, semantic models of, uh, of meanings of aggregates, things like gravel or sand or rice. Right, so how do we, how do, we do Mirio topology? So what we need, in addition to parthood, we need a primit another primitive relation, something that is usually called the connectedness, C. It's reflexive, reflexive symmetric, non-transitive, non not, not, it's not transitive. Uh, and it's implied by overlap. So, so you introduce it in such a way that it, it, it uh, relates with your, uh, it corresponds with, or it bridges uh, this topological uh, component with the neurological component. The way you don't want it to be transitive is because you don't want to have, if you look at figure 23, you don't want to say that you have A, B, C, and A is connected to B, B is connected to C. You don't want to say that A is also connected to C, so you want to rule those cases out. 
So if we have a mirrorological or mirrorotopological structure as in figure 24, so the vertical dimension tracks uh, parthood. So A is part of A and B and, and is part of itself also based on, on uh, uh, but the, the horizontal uh, dimension tracks connectedness. So what's connected to each other. So in this case, A is connected to A and B because it's part of A and B, but it's also connected to B because B is part of uh, A and B. Okay, so this gives you additional additional uh, power to to uh, to model various interesting uh, spatial relations. Something that is very often used in, in in formal ontology. So we can you now you can distinguish between internal parts and tangential overlap and 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 other things, and and with more. Um, defining more, uh, deriving more notion, you can also distinguish between an interior of an object, its exterior, and so on. Uh, and at this point, you you can derive a, a crazy set of uh, more uh, complex uh, properties, a property, for example, a property that is called uh, self-connectedness, uh, defined in 30, uh, which which is supposed to uh, which 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 tells you that um, uh, it, no two uh, the, so every two parts of an entity basically overlap. So that property gives you uh, 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 gives you a tool uh, to mo to model things that cannot be divided into separate parts. But but one problem with this property is that does not exclude touching uh, property, uh, touching entities. Okay, so you want also something a little bit more stronger. You want to, you want thirty-one, so something called strongly self-connected, connectedness, which says that uh, if something is strongly self-connected, then not only uh, uh, this entity is self-connected, but its interior is also self-connected. So this is something that really comes in one piece. Okay, this is this this would be true of things that come in one piece. But then again, uh, you want it a, a little bit stronger. You want you want to add maximality. So this is in 32 the MSSC property. So maximal is strongly self-connected, and and you relativize it to a property. So in this case, you basically have. Uh, uh, you have something that is strongly self-connected, and nothing else that is part of that uh, of that entity um, uh, uh, is. Uh, yeah, and then and there's no other part that is part of that entity is not strongly self-connected. Right. So, so this this was super quick. So sorry for that. But what this gives us is that it allows us to distinguish between different types of entities. So if we look at figure. 31, there are two different um, kinds of entities. So in the square uh, A and B, using pure mirology, there's no way of distinguishing this kind of uh, the square AB between, say, uh, the sum of uh, the figures C and D, or even uh, the sum B and C. Okay, but with mirror topology, the status of the object A and B is different than the uh, status of the of an entity, such as a, a an arbitrary sum. Uh, so that's great. So we can now actually get closer to what cognitive science tells us about we perceive objects and how it relates to how it relates to counting. And finally, you can actually. But what you can do is you can uh, you can postulate that this MSSC property, this this you know let's call it integrity uh, property, is part of certain uh, it's lexically encoded uh, in the semantics of certain uh, in, of certain um, nouns. So count nouns would have it, and mass nouns would lack it, or would have some other kind of uh, mirrorotopological property, but not this one. Okay, so you make a lexical distinction between various kinds of, uh, of nominal expressions. And you can also say that, well, numerals are a class of uh, quantifiers that um, require things they combine with to denote integrated holes. So one way of doing that is to saying, well, numerals are in fact complex uh, expressions. There's an element that refers to a natural number, and there's another another part of that expression 
uh, allows you to quantify. Okay, so going back to what we've seen again from the cognitive literature, that the, the distinction is, is seems to be very relevant. Uh, and this quantificational element, I call it CL, but it's like whatever, tells you two things. Okay, gives you two things. It gives you a requirement that whatever combines with it needs to refer to integrated things to MSSC entities. This is by, done by the MSSC presupposition. And, and it also allows you to quantify uh, over those things via, say, a measure function, but you could use uh, anything else you like. Okay, and this, and this helps us to understand and to explain what happens in various counting constructions. So here we have a partitive construction. This is, say, English. Is this a uh, German, right? It's phi tilet is apples, two parts of the apple. And what we have in this, uh, in the structure uh, is we start with apple, with apple. This is a count noun, which is an integrated part um, or a set of, uh, set of integrated holes. Uh, but at the moment we reach tile, okay, which tells us, okay, we are talking about parts of, um, of the apple. You're you're talking about various parts, okay? Are either contiguous or discontiguous? And those parts that are discontiguous cannot combine with a numeral. So you need an additional element. And in some cases, we have seen some, um, some proportional quantifiers mark this element in with a special morpheme or uh, it's made uh, salient uh, by a different syntactic structure. And when the entire chunk of the structure tells you, well, you're an integrated whole, you're good to combine with, um, uh, with a numeral, and that's how you, and that's how you uh, can do uh, counting in natural language. Uh, there's some uh, derivation how it happens. We can talk about it later, but I think that this, uh, uh, it's time to conclude. So we've seen that there are two independent cognitive systems, but they both give cert uh, in language, it's like the, the result is basically the same. Uh, we've seen that the one-to-one -one correspondence between entities and numbers is, is relevant, and, and the way there are uh, non-trivial uh, principles that govern it. Uh, and we have seen that natural language is, um, has a lot of expressions that relate to what we know about uh, cognition and those many of those facts are reflected in grammar and finally we i were we, we were able to define a general quantificational mechanism called general uh, counting principles that allows us to count both parts or and holes and if an identical restrictions apply and those uh, restrictions are the non-overlap principle, the maximality principle, and the integrity principle. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much.